Indicative mark cannot decide thus in the absence of any logic behind it. Vedantin. That defect does not arise. Sutra 5. Ubhaya vyamo ha tat siddhe. Tat siddhe. That being established. Ubhaya. Vyamohat, on account of both the person and the path being unconscious. Translation Because that stands established on account of both the traveler and the path being then unconscious. Now, those who would pass along the path through flame, etc., have their senses and organs bunched up owing to their separation from the bodies, and so they are devoid of independent action. The flame, etc., also are not independent, they being insentient. So it can be understood that some deities who are sentient and identify themselves with and preside over the flame, etc., are engaged in the work of escorting. In common experience, too, when people become intoxicated or unconscious and have their senses befuddled, they are led through their paths by others. Besides, the flame, etc., being uncertain, cannot be the indicative marks or features of the path, for one dying at night cannot reasonably have an accession of daylight, and it was stated earlier that there can be no waiting for the day. But such a defect does not arise when these have permanence in their identity with the deities. That the deities are mentioned by the words flame, etc., can be justified on the ground that they identify themselves with these. And such statements as, From flame to the daytime, Chandogya 4, 15, 5, and 5, 10, 1, do not create any difficulty. Even if the escorting deities are meant, the meaning in that case being, through the instrumentality of the deity of flame, they reach the deity of the daytime. Through the instrumentality of the deity of the daytime, they reach the deity of the bright fortnight. In common parlance, also, people impart instruction about the guides on the way thus From here you go to Valavarnam, then to Jayasingha then to Krishna Gupta. Moreover, the statement in the beginning is, they reach the flame, which merely tells us of coming in contact, but not of any special form of it. At the end, however, comes the statement, he escorts them to Brahman, Chandogya 4.15.6, where a special form of contact between an escort and the escorted is stated. From this it can be ascertained that the same kind of contact exists in the beginning as well. But owing to the very fact that all the senses then become bunched up, no experience is possible there. As for the word world, literally a place of experience, that can well be used even with regard to the beings who simply pass through without getting experience inasmuch as these words supply real experiences to their own residence. Hence, a man who reaches the world presided over by the deity of fire is guided along by the god of fire, and the man who reaches the world presided over by the god of air is guided forward by the god of air. This is how the passage is to be construed. Opponent On the supposition that the conducting deities are meant, how would that view be valid in the cases of Varuna and others? For Varuna and others are placed after lightning, and from lightning up till Brahman is reached, a superhuman being is mentioned in the Upanishad as acting as the escort. Vedantin. Hence, the aphorist gives the answer. Sutra 6. 
Vajutainaiva tatastat shrute tataha. From there, that is, from lightning, they are guided from above. Vajutaina eva, by the very same being who comes to lightning. Tat shrute, for so the Upanishad says. Translation. From there they are guided by the very same being who comes to lightning, for it is of him that the Upanishad speaks. It is to be understood that from there, after arriving at lightning, they go to the world of Brahman, being led through the worlds of Varuna and others under the guidance of a superhuman being who exists even beyond lightning. For that very being is mentioned as the guide in the Upanishadic text, a superhuman being comes and escorts them from there to the world of Brahman. Chandogya 4.15.5 As for Varuna and others, it is to be understood that they somehow contribute to the task of that superhuman being by either not creating any obstruction or helping positively. Accordingly, it is well said that flame, etc., stand for the escorting deities. Namaste. So this knowledge is called Aupurusheya, which means it's beyond human knowledge. Especially now that we know that the soul is unconscious and doesn't experience the major part of the path after death, then how is this knowledge passed down? See, where does it come from? Well, it can only come from one place, and that is the higher living beings, whether the demigods or all the way up, you know, to Shiva and Shakti. This knowledge is about what happens to the soul after death while unconscious, passing through these different worlds and carried by or escorted by superhuman beings. So that means the knowledge has to come from those superhuman beings themselves. It can't come from human beings because our mind and senses can't penetrate that realm after death. Huh? The uh, jiva twam upadi, the covering that results in a living being, an individual living being, a human being, does not go that far. It's limited. Our knowledge is limited by our very nature as a being. So, we have to depend on higher sources. And that is the nature of all Vedic knowledge. Ultimately, it comes from sources beyond human beingness. This is very important because, for example, I had one friend for a while <laughs> until I found out that he doesn't believe in the absolute nature of the Vedas. Instead, he says, oh yeah, some, some human beings wrote them down, you know, maybe a few thousand years ago, and they're just passed down by tradition like that. So then, if that's true, how did they get this knowledge? How did they know? Huh? If they're human beings, if they're like us, basically he was saying, you know, the Vedas are written by people like us. Then how did they get the knowledge of what happens after death? See, are they just making it up? Is it a fantasy? Is it a nice idea that somebody had, you know, smoke a little ganja? And <laughs> no, no. These are factual accounts. This knowledge is absolute and perfect. And it's beyond the range of human intelligence. That's how we know that the source of Vedic wisdom is beyond the human being has to be. Otherwise, how could we know, for example, the story of creation? 
which is narrated in quite a few different Vedic literatures. There were no human beings then. At the very beginning, there weren't even any demigods. Therefore, this knowledge has to be coming down from the very beginning. And what did the Vedas themselves say? That the Vedas are spoken by the breathing of Mahavishnu. See, Mahavishnu lies down on the causal ocean and goes to sleep. And what he dreams is what we call reality. <laughs> but our reality is very different from his reality because he is not covered by Jiva Tvamupadi. He's covered by Isha Tvamupadi, which means he has all-pervading knowledge. So <laughs> his dreams are of a completely different character. His dreams are of our reality. So, and let's not even try to guess what is his reality. <laughs> but he knows everything. His consciousness extends everywhere. His presence is universal. That's what Vishnu means, all pervading. So we can't second guess this knowledge. We can't speculate this knowledge. For example, in, uh, you know, New Age spiritual circles, we hear about spirit guides, you know, this is real woo-woo stuff. And basically, they say that, you know, these spirit guides come and take you on a journey in the astral realm. Well, this is all hogwash, you know, <laughs> it's simply imagination. It's not based on anything factual. It's just a dream. But it's a dream without reference to the Vedas, without any substantial basis. It's simply a projection or an imagination based on this idea that the soul is carried after death. Those souls who have realized the conditioned Brahman, not just any, uh, but some very special people, the 1%, the top, the top most human beings who have realized Brahman. How? Well, we've gone over it a bunch of times on this channel through karma yoga, bhakti yoga, raja yoga, and jnana yoga they realize the four states of consciousness, Jagrat, Svapna, Sushupti, and ultimately Turiya. And when they do, they become qualified to go to the spiritual world after death, to go to the world of Brahman, which is infinitely superior to this world of the earthly planets. Because here there's birth and death. Nobody can stay here more than 100 years or so. Yeah, there are a few exceptions, and some yogis are reported to have lived a little bit longer, but, you know, it's not really significant. Whereas in the world of Brahman, one can live as long as the material universe exists. So, I mean, really, really there's no comparison. You might as well say, till the end of time. Uh, so this is what we're going for. This is what we're trying to attain. A life that is until the end of time and is based on a beautiful, loving relationship with God or goddess in whichever form we realize them. So, of course, this is infinitely preferable to human life on planet Earth. As I've pointed out so many times, this place is a ghetto. It's a slum. There's so much nasty things here and suffering like anything, especially mental suffering, because we don't know the truth. That's why the Vedas give us the truth 
Uh, they give us the real lowdown. <laughs> In uh, street talk, lowdown means secret or down low huh? means secret. So this secret knowledge, this confidential knowledge is revealed by higher beings and comes from sources beyond this human life to show us the path to perfect enlightenment. Aung Tat Sat, Aung Shakti Aung, Aung Namah Shivaya.